Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see so many lovely people early in the morning on a Friday in this auditorium. I too would like to set the record straight. I don't think I'm a great man. I'm an ordinary person like all of you. And the only greatness is that I had the privilege of living with my grandfather and learning a few important lessons from him. And uh, I want to speak to you about not only those lessons, but about anger, about respect, about building relationships, and basically about what did he mean by nonviolence. These were issues that were very important to me when I was a teenager, and believe you me, I was a teenager at one stage in my life. <laughs> and I did have all of these issues, like many of you have them. This is a cycle that goes on uh, from generation to generation. And uh, unfortunately, not many of us have the privilege of having uh, wise people tell us how to deal with uh, these issues. And uh, I was very fortunate because that helped me in um, defining my life, in making sure that I didn't uh, succumb to anger and, and uh, all the violence that goes on in society and destroy my life, but that I was able to make something out of it. Before I go on with my talk, I want to invite you to participate in a little game. I want you to partner up with the person sitting next to you. I want each person to have a partner. I want one member of the partnership to make a tight fist and imagine that you have the world's most precious diamond in the fist and I want the other member to open the fist. All right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now tell me very honestly, how many of you asked the other person to open the fist? <laughs> so you see how violence has steeped into us. I simply asked you to have the fist open, but instead of asking the person, everybody became physical and started manipulating the fist. <laughs> so we have a lot of work to do. <clears throat> we have to understand our own weaknesses and we have to understand that violence does exist in each one of us and that we have to make a conscious effort to overcome this. Many years ago, my grandfather, as a young lawyer, went to South Africa and um, he wanted basically to just start a legal practice and earn money because the family had taken enormous loans for him to go to England and study law and he had to pay back those loans. So he was desperate to start a legal practice. And he got this opportunity in South Africa, and that's how he went there. But he didn't realize that at that time, there was considerable amount of racism in South Africa, and uh, everybody seemed to hate everybody else. And one day, he uh, decided to travel from Durban to Johannesburg, which is an overnight train journey. And he got a first-class uh, train ticket and he got into the train in Durban. And at the next station, a white man came into the train and saw this black person sitting there. And he was shocked. And very rudely, he told my grandfather to get out of the, this compartment. He said, this is meant for whites only. And my grandfather said that I have a first class ticket 
and I intend to travel by first class. So this person went and got uh, the police and the railway officials and all of them together, they literally picked up grandfather and threw him off the train. And if, as though that was not enough humiliation, he was subsequently beaten up by some white people, uh, beaten up severely enough that he had to be taken to the hospital and uh, uh, hospitalized for a few days. But then the police uh, picked up these people who had uh, assaulted grandfather. And uh, they invited grandfather to come to the police station and file charges against uh, them and said, uh, then we can take some legal action against him. And grandfather came to the police station and he said, uh, I don't want to file charges. He says, um, I want them to learn a lesson from this and I want them to learn that what they did was wrong and that this should not happen again. And I think the best way they will learn uh, this lesson is if I forgive them and let them walk out of this uh, police station. And hopefully that will uh, make them understand that what they did was wrong. And the police were shocked. And they said, uh, you know, you, you, if you don't file charges, they're just going to walk out from here and we won't be able to do anything about it. And he said, that's fine. I, I would like them to walk out and uh, hopefully they'll learn a lesson. And they did learn a lesson. The four people who uh, were involved in this assault against him, three of them became my grandfather's followers and uh, followed him throughout his uh, work in, in South Africa. Now he could have filed charges and, and punished them and, and sent them to prison. And I don't think they would have learned any lesson there. They would have just come out of the prison uh, convinced that they were right and that they, would, uh, they need to go on pursuing their racist policies. So that is basically a very intelligent way of using anger. Now I had the same kind of experience when I was growing up in South Africa. I was only 10 years old when I was beaten up by some white youth. And then a few months later, I was beaten up by black youth. Both the times because they didn't like the color of my skin. The whites thought I was too black and the blacks thought I was too white. And after that experience, I was full of rage. And I wanted eye for an eye justice. I wanted to be able to fight back and beat up people who messed around with me. And it became such an obsession with me that I started going to the gym and pumping iron so that I could be strong and be able to fight back again. And that's when my parents decided it was time to take me to India and give me the opportunity to live with grandfather and learn some lessons from him. And the first lesson that grandfather taught me was about understanding that anger and using that anger intelligently. He said anger is like electricity. It is just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel the energy of anger in positive action so that we can use it for the good of humanity rather than destroying ourselves in the process of getting revenged. He, he asked me to write an anger journal. He said, every time you become angry about something, don't act on that anger, but go and write it down in your journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem, and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that's very important, because today a lot of people tell me they've been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped them because every time they go back and read the journal, they're reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. 
So we don't want the journal to be a reminder of the incident. We want the journal to help us find an equitable solution to the problem and then commit ourselves to finding a solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to deal with my anger in a positive manner rather than abusing that anger and destroying my own life in the process. This is something that all of us face all the time. We get angry and we act in that moment of anger, we act in the moment of madness, and we destroy our own life. We may destroy the life of the person who caused the anger, but in the process we destroy our own life. And that doesn't help anybody. It's, it's a very you know, negative kind of attitude. So we need to learn how to use that anger positively so that we don't destroy our lives and we don't destroy other people's lives, but we are able to move ahead from there and create an atmosphere where we can all live uh, in peace and harmony. Now that's not impossible for us to do. It's just a question of learning about anger, making a determined effort not to succumb to anger, but to use that energy positively. Now that requires some mental exercise. You know, we, uh, because we don't do any mental exercise, we, we generally spend our time doing a lot of physical exercise, but we don't do any mental exercise, and so our minds are very weak. And uh, that's why when we get angry, we um, lose it. We, we just go and do things that we regret later on. So we've got to do mental exercises that will give us the ability to control our minds. Now the fact that you come to school and you learn and you educate yourself is not mental exercise. I would describe that as getting a computer and filling that computer with a lot of software. And eventually that computer is going to crash because you know, it just has the capacity to deal with some software but not a lot of it. So the same thing happens when, with us. We come to schools, we educate ourselves, we fill our minds with a lot of information. But because our mind is not strong enough to uh, deal with all of this, we crash. And we are not able to use that information uh, effectively. So my grandfather made me do some mental exercise to be able to gain control over, over the mind. And the fact that we don't have control of the mind uh, I mean, it's an indication that even here, as you sit here and listen to me speaking to you, your mind, and this is normal, I'm, I'm not blaming you alone, but it happens all the time, that your mind is filled with a dozen different thoughts. They're all racing through your mind at the same time, and so you're not able to focus to what is happening at this moment, give it your full attention. And that is because we don't have that control of the mind where we can block out all the other thoughts and just focus on what we want to do. And so this simple exercise that my grandfather made me do was a very effective exercise. It just meant that I had to sit quietly in my room uh, and shut out all the noises from outside for a few minutes and hold in front of me something that gave me pleasure to look at. It could be a flower, it could be a photograph of somebody, or whatever it is. Just hold that in front of me, and for one full minute, concentrate my entire mental faculties on that object. And then shut my eyes and see how long I can keep that image in my mind's eye. In the beginning, I found that the moment I shut my eyes, the image vanished. It's like going to the gym and on the first day I'm trying to lift up a hundred pound weight and I can't do it. 
But you don't give up there. You start working slowly and go, go on until you reach that 100 pound weight there. So in this case too, the first day you may close your eyes and the image vanishes, but if you do this exercise regularly, you will find that you can keep that image longer and longer in your mind's eye. And to that extent, you can uh, then get control over your mind. I did this and it helped me considerably and I'm sure that if you learn to do it, you will find that it helps you not only in dealing with your anger, but in dealing with all the work that you do. Your work, your homework, your schoolwork, your, as adults, your work in workplaces, everything will be much more efficient because you'll be able to put 100% of your attention on what you are doing at that moment. So it's a very helpful thing for us to learn. And these are things that all of us need to learn uh, as part of our education process. It's not enough just to come to school and get the ability to get a career and go out as doctors and teachers and, and, and others and engineers and, uh, and go and make money. All of that will be not worth anything if you don't have control over your mind and if you submit to uh, pressures and, and uh, you know, destroy your life. Every day these days we are reading about young people who commit suicide, who um, do silly things and, and uh, destroy their lives, all because there, there's frustration, there's hopelessness, and there's anger, and they don't know how to deal with this. And it's a simple thing that we have to learn how to deal with and how to uh, accept this. I want to talk to you a little about um, what nonviolence means, what my grandfather meant by nonviolence. And then I want to talk to you a little about relationships and respect. Now, a lot of people today, when I talk about nonviolence, they get the impression that, oh, well, we don't go out and fight, we don't, you know, bully people, or we are not at war with people, so we are living in peace, and um, we don't need to change. I just demonstrated to you before this lecture that we all have that violent tendencies in us, that we resort to violence at the first uh, instance, instead of finding better ways of dealing with this. And so we need to understand what do we mean by violence and what, does, what did my grandfather mean when he said that we must become the change that we wish to see in the world. It's a very popular quotation of his it's going around the country and I'm sure all of you have read this and heard this sometime or the other, that we must become the change. What did he mean by that? That we have to acknowledge that we are violent and we practice violence. I learned this lesson as a young boy. I was just 13 years old then, living with grandfather. And I was going to a school and I had a notebook and a pencil in my hands. And one day I was coming back from school and I happened to look at the pencil. It was about three inches long. And I thought to myself, I deserve a better pencil. This is too small for anybody to use. And without a second thought, I just threw that pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I went and asked grandfather for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on, and I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. <laughs> and I said, you must be joking. I said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do, he has a flashlight. <laughs> Take this flashlight and go out and look for the pencil. And I must have spent about two hours searching for that pencil and when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. 
the first lesson is that even in the making of a pencil, a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overuse or throw away because we have so much of it, that every time we indulge in any of these actions, we are contributing to violence, either against nature or against humanity. To make me learn this lesson properly, he made me draw a family tree of violence on the same principles as the genealogical tree, with violence as the grandparent, and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to examine and analyze everything that I had experienced during the day and put them down in that, on that tree in their appropriate places. Now, if it was the kind of violence where physical force was used against people, you know, all the things like punching and beating and kicking and, and, and all of these things that we resort to with one another, wars and killings and rapes and murders and, and the thousands of things that we do to one another where we use physical force. And that would go under physical violence. But there are many more things that we do without using physical force that sometimes we don't even recognize as being violence there because it's so much a part of our nature. It's things like discrimination, oppression, name calling, teasing, looking down on people, uh, you know, discriminating against people and, and all the hundreds and hundreds, overconsumption of resources and hundreds of things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, where we don't use any physical force. But yet, our actions hurt people, directly or indirectly. And we have to examine all those actions. Now, the simple thing that I had to do was to ask myself that did this action that I took did it help somebody or did it harm somebody? And if I come to the conclusion that it harmed somebody, then it would go under passive violence. Now we have to be honest about this kind of uh, introspection. And if we do it diligently, it'll be a very revealing thing for us. In a few months, I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. And that is when I became aware of how much passive violence I was committing and how much was being committed in the world. And once I became aware of it, then I could do something about bringing about a change. But if we are not aware of it, if we live in denial, then we are going to say, well, I don't need to change, I don't need to do anything, and we just go on practicing that kind of violence all the time. So I would advise you to take this up as a personal project, or as a family project, or even as a class project. Every morning begin by making this tree of violence and see how um, you have contributed to passive violence or physical violence during the day. And once you become aware of it, then what do you need to do to become a better human being? This should be a part of our educational process. There. Because education is not, as I said earlier, simply getting a career and going out into the marketplace and making money. Education is about becoming a better human being. 
Life is not going around in circles from birth to death. Life is going up, climbing a ladder. A ladder of success, not only in material terms, but in moral terms. That you are going to be better human beings today than you were yesterday. This has to be a conscious effort that all of us have to make. And keep climbing up that ladder slowly, one rung at a time every day. But if we don't have that conscious effort, if we just come to school and learn from textbooks and go away and say we've done enough of learning for the day, then we won't progress at all. Learning is a lifelong experience. What you learn in schools is just a part of your experience. What you learn from outside from people you meet and from experiences you have and from everything that happens every day, what you take from that is what you will become eventually. And so don't think that when you walk out of the school that your learning is over and that you can now enjoy life and, and be a free person. You have to continuously keep learning from every little thing that happens every day. And it's only then that you become a better human being. If you can eliminate all the negative from that learning and absorb all the positive from it. In a culture of violence that we have introduced in our lives today, we bring out all the worst aspects in human being. All the angers and frustrations and, and uh, prejudices and, and all of these worst things so that we can violently destroy the other person. We have to become as bad as that person to be able to destroy that person. So we don't become any better human beings. By trying to pull out a person from the gutter, if we go down into the gutter ourselves, then you know, we don't help anybody. We have to be better persons. We have to not succumb to anger and violence and find a better way of dealing with these issues. We have to find ways of, uh, of uh, changing the other person and changing society if we don't like what is going on in our societies. I want to talk briefly about respect, because that is also an issue that troubled me when I was growing up, and it's an issue that I'm sure troubles all of you. But I want you to know that respect doesn't come on its own. Respect has to be earned. Whether you want respect from your siblings, or whether you want respect from your parents, or respect from society, or respect from school people, or whatever. It has to be earned. It doesn't come free. And it can be earned in two ways. You can get respect out of fear, as some of you may have experienced, or I have learned about how gang members um, give you respect, but only after you have earned it only after you have um, done what they have told you to do and gotten down to their level, then they respect you. But they respect you only till you do what they want you to do. And the moment you stop doing what they want you to do, then there's no respect, then they destroy you because you are another, just another uh, vermin. But respect that comes out of kindness and love is a respect that lasts forever. Today, we are talking about my grandfather, 60 years after his death. We are talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, nearly 40 years after his death. Why? Because they earned respect out of love and kindness. And we value that. 
But we don't think about Hitlers and Stalin and, and all of them except in history books. We don't learn about them or we don't respect them because they were not people um, who, who earned their respect from kindness and love. They were violent and, and uh, destructive. So if we want respect, we have to earn it through our kindness and our uh, love for each other. We have to stop looking at people by the color of their skin or by the size or by their gender or by their uh, race and just begin to look at human beings as human beings. Now this can come only if we accept that culture of nonviolence. And the best way to build relationships between people in a culture of nonviolence is when we build relationships based on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation. You know, a lot of people today in the world think that they are independent individuals and they can do whatever we like and it's nobody's business. We are not independent individuals. We are interdependent, interconnected, and interrelated. And what happens to one happens to all of us eventually. And we have to understand that and respect that. And it's only when we respect that that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are here to fulfill a purpose. But we will be able to fulfill that purpose only when we know what our role in all of creation is. And when we understand that, then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and stop um, defining people by their color or their gender or their race or their uh, size. And just look at each other as human being and respect each other as human beings. And when we can do that, then we will be able to appreciate our own humanity. So we have to learn to become positive people, positive people who are determined to be become better human beings every day and work towards becoming better human beings. It won't happen on its own. We have to work towards achieving that. My grandfather had to work hard to become what he became. Dr. Martin Luther King had to work hard to become what he became. Cesar Chavez had to work hard to become what he became. It didn't come easy to them. They had to suffer. They had to go through all kinds of anguish and pain. But they were determined that they were not going to let somebody else determine what their life was going to be. When we submit to anger, we are allowing somebody else to de determine our, the course of our lives. And that's the wrong thing. Why should a stranger determine what the course of my life is going to be? So I want you to imagine, I could be driving down the highway, going from point A to point B, because it's important for me to reach point B for whatever reason. But while driving there, somebody cuts me off. And I get mad. How dare does this person cut me off? And so I escalate the thing and I, I chase after the person and show him the finger or cuss, cuss him or, or uh, you know, whatever we do on, uh, in road rage. And the next thing we know is, because guns are so easily available today, one or the other or both pull out their guns and shoot each other. And for what? Just for the you know, person cutting in? Now that person may be cutting in not out of being mean or something, but he, he or she may be rushing to something, uh, some emergency that they faced. Or they may, must have some other compulsion. But we don't look at all of those things. 
we just look at why did this person cut in and that person needs to be taught a lesson. And in the process of teaching that lesson, we destroy our lives and we destroy that person's life and achieve nothing at all. So don't give somebody else the right to determine what your life is going to be. Your life is for you to lead and you to determine what you are going to become. And don't give that away to somebody else. I want to conclude now with one story. A story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us when we lived with him. Of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came and did their best to explain to the king, but nobody could satisfy the king. And then there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit. And the king asked him to explain the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this. So the next day, the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course, the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. And so he didn't want to show his ignorance and he just quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace, found a little gold box and he placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would get up and open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. And this intellectual said, it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish, and that will be the end of the story. But if you had planted this grain of wheat outside in the soil and let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow, and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. That if somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow, and very soon we could have a whole world of peace. So I have come here today to give you the grain of wheat that I got from my grandfather, and I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it sprout and grow so that all of us together can transform this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you.